we are now up to council discussion. So why don't we do discussion first on this item. I'll start with whoever would like to start, then we'll go into motion. We'll do it a little bit backwards tonight. Anybody have any questions? If not, I can start off. Why don't you start off? You never go first. That's all right. That is unusual. All right. I know many of you, you know, come in and you're looking at a small portion of what you feel happens around your neighborhoods, happens in the city. We, we look at a much bigger umbrella. The, let, let's talk about the land before I start to address the five pages of notes that I took as you were all speaking. There, there is a working number on the land currently. The developer has offered to the staff at this time, and there isn't anything in writing just yet, but that occurs at the next step, which is what everybody I uh, tried to explain at the very beginning tonight, that um, the next step of this after transmittal is development agreement and everything that everybody's been asking for. Um, for them to expend the money now to do that without knowing there'd be transmittal is silly. There isn't one of you in this room who would do that. So we have to be fair even if you don't want to be fair. The working number on the land has been $7.5 million. Now, I sat down with Mr. Cobb today and uh, over the last couple of weeks, let me, let me show you how this all works. <clears throat> Between the lease that's left on the land plus the purchase price, plus about $15 million or so is the working number from staff right now to move the water, which we could do. We can move the water later on over to the golf course. The golf course currently does have uh, percolation, uh, has a pond on it that holds, what Mr. Cobb, you told me a couple of three million gallons? That's a couple of million. I'm sorry? A couple of million. Yeah, holds a couple of million gallons already mm -hmm. that we put the wet water in. Oh, the, that, 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 that pond is actually across the street and it holds five million gallons. Right, five million gallons, right. Okay. I, I thought it was higher. I wasn't going to disagree with you. Uh, no, I thought uh, you meant on, on site. There's another pond correct. that's on site. Uh, and while I'm talking about the wet water storage, you know, the, the second speaker that came up here, <laughs> I just got a laugh. Uh, we are required, and Bobby, you can come on up and confirm this, please, by the DEP to have X number of spray fields for wet water. Because the reason why you have to spray your wet water is when it's raining and we can't sell the wet water. Correct, Bobby? That's correct. Uh, well, there's, when you treat wastewater, as you know, there's, you get two things out of it. You get solids and you get water. Mm -hmm. Water can be in two conditions. It can be reclaimed quality, which we use for irrigation, and it's reject water, which is not quite the irrigation standard. You have to get rid of it. You can't use it for irrigation. The wet weather storage you're speaking about is reclaimed quality water that cannot be used during a rainy condition. We've got to put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So right now we use the ponds for reclaimed disposal. We also use it for reject storage, a reject um, disposal. Affluent. Correct. Okay. All right. So, but there is a formula that is required based on the size of the plant, the amount of water, that dictates the size of these percolation ponds. You're required to maintain 100% uh, of the plant's permitted capacity for reject disposal. Right, 100%. Yeah, and it's not always used at one time. We, you can, you can, we use the term waste. You can w waste the reject water from zero to 100%. So you can use anywhere from zero to 100% of the land at one time. So it wouldn't be at all plausible that you could fit all that on three acres? No, sir. No. Thank you, Bobby. All right. So we have to keep these, we have to have a place to put the water, folks. It's got to go somewhere. Um, the lease on the land runs through to 2034. Um, I'll stay on the water, then I'll get to the impact fee credits. So let me get back to my math. Move everything off of here when the lease ends. The guesstimates have been anywhere from 10 to 15 million dollars. Now we know what happens when you put these things together. They always end up being the high number. So let's just take the high number. So you got 15 million. 
or even if we go somewhere in the middle, you got the lease, uh, 18 million. That's how much you, the citizens, whether this project happens or not, are eventually going to spend to take care of that water when the lease runs out, plus paying the lease. Now, subtract 7.5 million to buy it. Subtract about 7.5 million to convert everything that's over there, lay a new pipe, build a huge pond, a lake, that can be used not only for the wet water storage, to build a tank to hold the affluent, to make all of this 100% sustainable, because now there'll be a pipe going back to the sewer plant, rather than spraying the water out on the field and wasting it, it'll be held in a pond and reused. The affluent will be reused, not just thrown out on the ground, because it'll go back through the plant one more time. More revenue for the city, more reclaimed water to sell. You're not just wasting it. So you do all the math, and you save about three or four million dollars. And you own 32 acres of land. That's how you've got to look at this when it comes to the blue area on the map. Because the blue area on the map can hold the wet water storage, can hold the tank for the affluent, can have a pipe back over to the uh, sewer plant, and still leaves all that land for some future city council to sit here and make a huge passive park or whatever they may want to do with it. That'll be their decision. It's very limited what you can do with it under public lands. The other uh, thing that'll be done is the stormwater that's currently held on this property can be moved into that pond, that big pond that'll be built. So we can get the stormwater off the city hall property and open up more options for the new police station for buildings that'll be needed here at city hall. The developer's water will also be held in that pond, and they will pay their pro rata share to build that pond. It'll be in the developer's agreement. Oviedo Boulevard, because it is in the transportation master plan, because it will take uh, traffic off of intersections, the developer is entitled to discuss impact fee credits. That isn't anything given special to this developer as being, you know, emails going out today and uh, you know, I just love campaign season. Thank God I don't have to do it anymore. Uh, but, guys, if there's another one of those, whoever just did it will be thrown out. Um, every developer is entitled to impact fee credits if they build something that's in the plan. That doesn't mean they get it dollar for dollar. There is a formula that goes into it. The land that they give for the road, which runs up on the top there, they're entitled to impact fee credits for. It's an entitlement. They, 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 they can ask for it because that road will service not only this project, but will have, help the traffic flow through the area. They will not get 100% dollar for dollar. They get a, Mr. Cobb, help me out, you told me today, they get the credit for the base road, the, ba the basic road. They get, they get credit for what's beyond what they need. So the road, the road that would serve them is what would be required of them. They get credit for what's beyond what is required for them. Correct. So they have to pay for the road that services them, the portion of it, and they get credit for the extra capacity. That's how it works, folks. Not dollar for dollar. Don't, don't listen to this stuff. <laughs> The project is going to have 55 plus, that's the blue buildings on the bottom. The top blue buildings are something new that was added because the, again, they were listening and it's a condominium portion. We don't have ownership condominiums anywhere in this city. They don't exist. Do you know how many empty nesters ask me for those? They, they want, something that they can stay here in the city but they still want ownership rather than rental they'll have rental they'll have 55 and plus rental but they're also going to have ownership units and uh rick if correct me if i'm wrong you told me this morning 100 to 120 units is what you're looking at in the condo area 
Could you just, I'm sorry, could you just come on up here? Barbara will go <clears throat> crazy if you're not at the microphone. Uh, just grab the mic, Rick, or you're going to, okay. <clears throat> One of the, the largest, biggest things that uh, the staff and talking to the lots and lots of citizens in Oviedo is a downtown. Uh, you had a downtown, now you have Oviedo on the park, but next to City Hall, you want to have a downtown. And so the idea of condos with retail or office or professional services on the first floor with some beautiful condos with some nice amenities above it. And it all leads down to the City Hall. If you want to build it on both sides of the street, again, to give it charm. And as you see, the staff designed Oviedo Boulevard, not a two-lane road. <laughs> that is a big, wide, beautiful area with a plaza, with all these other amenities to draw people down, and they can enjoy it. Right. The two-lane road is the east-west road going back over to Clara Lake. Yes, sir. Okay. So condo component, 55-plus <coughs> component. Retail in the developers agreement. There'll be no drive-throughs allowed because it's going to be just like Oviedo on the park. Yes, sir So uh, That was put into the plan because as mr. Cobb said and correct me if I'm wrong You have to do the traffic study by the highest and best use whatever yes. that may be Correct. All right. Thank you Rick. Uh, Mayor can we get mr. Llewellyn's name and address please? Oh name and address for the record Rick. I'm sorry uh, 514 Rencourt, Wheaton, Illinois. Go Bears. <laughs> did they win yesterday? They did. Oh, oh, okay. You didn't see that? No, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Um, but I do want to move here, by the way. I will be living in the complex. Okay, that'll be good. Um, traffic. Let's talk about traffic. It's number one on everybody's mind. We get it. We drive on the same roads you all drive on. I work in the city, as you all know, every single day. I'm here all day long. I'm not a commuter where, you know, some folks are commuters. I understand it. You leave Oviedo. When you come back, all you see is traffic. I used to do that many years ago. When we had our furniture stores and <clears throat> they were up in Altamont, I used to drive that Red Bug, Mitchell Hammock, Altamont 436. I did it every day. At 8 o'clock and at 5 o'clock I came home. I get it. That's not what the traffic looks like 24-7 around here. It moves during the day. It moves when school is out. Now, you know, if the schools had busing that was more than two miles and more kids took buses rather than all of us driving our children to school, the roads free up pretty darn good. But that's not what we have to deal with. You heard Mayor Walters mention earlier about the cut-through studies. The numbers are staggering. The counts of folks who cross 419 and Snow Hill Road to come through our city. Staggering. So that leads me into my next point, which is why 419 and 426 are going to be widened. The contract is scheduled to be let out May of 2020. Because those folks coming down that road, instead of having to make that jog, are going to go straight, and they're going to end up at the same spot, right by the hospital corner where Wawa and Mobile is in the Greenway, which is where they're all going. So, you know, for 20 years we've been working on that road. 20. When Mr. O'Hanlon was sitting up here and I was first elected, it was one of the first things we did was lift the constraints so we can get these roads wide. I urge all of you, if you want to see more improvement plans, September 30, correct, Mr. Cobb? Uh, yes. 6 o'clock or 5.30? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock here at City Hall. The um, uh, county is coming in with the first look at the plans for improving 434, finally. It'll be the northern end. I guess they're going to do the northern end first down into the old downtown. And then they'll do the connection piece between uh, Mitchell Hammock and the old downtown. They, they have some constraints there. Uh, obviously, you just have to drive the road and you can see the constraints. 
if the constraints weren't put on these state and county roads, folks, back in the 80s, you'd have four-lane roads all over the city of Oviedo right now, just like every four-lane road is that leads up to the city of Oviedo. Mm -hmm. When we lifted the constraints, because all the other roads had already been programmed, all the other roads had already been done, we became what's known as infill roads. Now, credit Mayor Walters, because he was on Metro Plan and he got the ball rolling, after the city committed a couple of million dollars, this is how important we know 419 and 426 is. We took a couple of million dollars of the second generation sales tax and the city paid for the PD&E study on that road in order to accelerate it at Metro Plan. And believe it or not, that acceleration got it into the window we're in now. Without it, they probably still wouldn't even be talking about the road. We have intersection improvements coming on Mitchell Hammock and 434, Lockwood and Mitchell Hammock and 419 and Lockwood. Those are all coming in the coming year. That's being paid for out of one cent sales tax money in conjunction with the state and the county. So we understand the traffic. We get that part of it. Uh, let's see. Somebody mentioned uh, hasty. Well, I, the developer's been down here for two years talking about this. Uh, he was at LPA back in April. He was told at LPA he, he was turned down five to two. Wasn't unanimous. He was turned down, but he was also told certain things. I watched it myself. I was at home, watched the whole thing, and came back with a plan that sort of mirrored what he was asked to do. So, you know, hasty, I just, I, I don't believe in that. Uh, Mr. Cobb, there's a number thrown around about a 490% increase in the ask. I, I, I don't even know where that number is coming from. I, I don't. Yeah. Pardon? I don't. Sure. I, the only thing I can think of is if you took, if you said it's vacant now, so it's zero, and then, I mean, Okay. That's the only thing I can think of. All right. I, I, I don't even know where that number is. I saw that number this morning. I just had to giggle. Somebody brought up the mall. <clears throat> You're right. The mall right now is like every other small regional mall. That's what we have, folks. It is a small regional mall. Get out of your Oviedo bubble for a moment. Go to any small regional mall anywhere in the Central Florida area, and they all are suffering. They're all changing. Our mall has an exceptional plan right now where they're turning, well, let me be careful how I phrase this. They're starting to turn, through a company called Neroware, the mall into shared workspace. They're pretty darn successful right now. These, these kids, you want to talk about brilliant kids, these guys are all 20-somethings. They've raised millions of dollars for their effort. They started with seven or 8,000 square feet at the mall. They just took over the old FYE, and they're looking at taking over more space. With Sears closing, as much as that pains all of us because of the folks who won't have, have jobs anymore, that's going to give them all the opportunity for more office space, perhaps, for more of this shared space. Because what you're going to see the mall doing is they're going to turn, looking at the movie theater, to the left, the Sears side, into they're, they're envisioning a shared workspace up and down that whole corridor. That's, that's their vision. And then they've been moving the retail that was still left over there, they've been moving it to the right-hand side of the mall, the Dillard side of the mall. And they want to make that all retail. So there's a plan. We get it. But um, retail isn't something that's going to fit into a mall nowadays. I do this all the time. Raise your hands if you have an Amazon Prime account. Don't be shy. I have one. We all have one. Everybody in this room has one. Well, maybe not everybody. I shouldn't be so presumptuous, but I'll, I'll say 90% of us have them. Daryl, you don't have one? You don't, Ingrid? Well, that doesn't surprise me. But a lot of us do. Um, interconnectivity. Let, 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 let's talk about the downtown master plan. 
the downtown master plan has always envisioned this land across the street being Oviedo on the Park 2, let's call it. We said it when we were out planning Oviedo on the Park, when, we were, when the, the vote was being taken for it, when we were walking around handing out the flyers. I mean, many of you weren't here then, so you don't know it. And I get it. Some of you may have been. Many of you weren't. We walked around with flyers. We have, uh, I still have them at home. And we told everybody, this is phase one, that'll be phase two. Because the ultimate plan, when you open up the downtown master plan book and you look, is for the urban core, the city core, the rectangle of the city core, it was up on one of the slides earlier, to go from City Hall to Franklin Street and connect the whole thing. Make it walkable. Make it a, 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 a sense of place. That was the whole plan. It's always been the plan. That's the way the comp plan's written. Because it was the plan. 50, 60 people got together, and we were on that committee. I was on it. Tom, I think you were on it, right? Um, anybody up here on it? Maybe? I said, I know. We, we sat here in these chambers for a year and a half. Hammering that all out. Um, so I talked about that. Somebody mentioned the um, entitlements. The entitlements they have, they can, they can, and it's not a threat. It, it, it's just something you, when you sit here, you have to balance. They can buy that land right now and develop 700,000 square foot of retail space. Now, whether they could get it to fill up, whether they could actually do it, I don't know, folks. But that's what they're entitled to with three or four times the traffic counts. And you can all come down here and complain about it, tell the council not to do it. There isn't anything you can do. They're entitled to it. If that was a shopping center, which is what that zoning um, allows, because back in the day, that's all there was. There were these strips, there were these strip centers anchored by a grocery store with acres of parking in front of them. We have them all over the place. We have an Albertsons that failed. Who remembers cash and carry? All right, so you all know what cash and carry was. Food Most of the folks don't know. The brick building where uh, LA Fitness is right now was originally built to be a grocery, sorry, Bob, <laughs> was originally built to be a grocery store. And then cash and carry went bankrupt or food line or whoever it was who owned uh, cash and carry at the time. And the thing sat empty for ages, ages and ages and ages. Mayor Walters was the one who finally found a development group who bought the plaza, and guess what we had to do? We had to give them some help and entitlements to get it to develop. And we did it. And now you have a plaza that works. Everyone talks about rural. When I first moved here in 1996, there were about 18,000 people in this city. When I was first elected in 2000, there was maybe 20,000 of us. Okay, we're not a rural community, guys. We're a city. And we're gonna grow into being a city, and we're gonna grow into being the best city that anybody has ever seen. Folks all over the place, we travel all the time, all of us up here. We all belong to different organizations, Tri-County League of Cities, Florida League of Cities, um, um, what's yours, the uh, count, thank you, count, mayors and managers. We're the envy of everybody. When I look on social media, I'm flabbergasted. Go live in any of these other cities and see if you get the services that you get from Oviedo, for the value of the dollar you get from Oviedo. Doesn't happen, folks. Nowhere, no how. Oviedo on the Park was brought up. Oviedo on the Park is fully leased, guys. 
That's why they're building what they're building right now. Every space over there, except for one of the commercial spaces on Oviedo Boulevard, <coughs> the office spaces, Collier Properties has leased. <coughs> so, um, single family homes, it was brought up um, that they're a break even. They are. You know, single family home, uh, I, I forgot. Mr. Cobb, do we know what the threshold is? We used to know, like, if the property was uh, valued at X, whether we broke even or have we ever figured that out lately? I, I don't think we've done a recent analysis. No, nah, because years ago it used to be like 150,000, something like that. I don't, know. I don't know what the number is nowadays, folks. But uh, the speaker who brought that up, and it, again, it might have been Mayor Walters, was it you, sir? Okay, thank you. Uh, he's right. They're break even. Every home you live in, every home that we all live in. You know, the services that we get based on the taxes that we pay with our homestead exemptions become break even. Commercial land, commercial properties, apartments, um, uh, any type of mixed use building, they don't have Save Our Homes. Altamont Springs. All right, I hear a lot, a lot of folks talk about, you know, Altamont's this, Altamont's that. Altamont Springs will not allow a developer to come in and build a condominium project or a fee simple project. They don't want them. They want apartments. They want apartments because when the economy uh, dives, they don't lose the valuation like a single family home does. So, I mean, just, just saying. Traffic calming on Alafay Woods Boulevard. Rick, can you come on up here for a second again, please? Rick, I called you last week, I think, about this. And I, and I mentioned to you that some of the feedback I was getting was the folks in Alafaya Woods are concerned about Alafaya Woods Boulevard. I asked you if you would consider, at some point in time, assuming we get past <clears throat> this hearing this evening, as part of our due diligence, what could possibly be done along Alafaya Woods Boulevard with the staff to address some of their concerns. Would you still be willing to do that for them? Yes, this project again, it's a life legacy project for me. I want this to be the best there can be and I want the citizens involved. We're going to have a lot more public meetings and would love to hear different ideas. Right, because this is just step one. Yes, I mean, this thing isn't coming up out of the ground tomorrow. It would be lucky if it starts construction in 18 months, two years. Yes. Right? At least Lots and all the staff meetings, there's at least 15 that I know that we'd have to go through before we put a shovel in the ground. Right. So I, I discussed traffic calming on Alafay Woods Boulevard with Mr. Cobb uh, last, last week, was it, Brian? Yes. Last week, week before at lunch, we were talking about it. And uh, Mr. Cobb likes the idea of putting Alafay Woods Boulevard on a diet. But uh, we'll talk about that <laughs> later on. Thank you, Rick. What did you say, Brian? Make it a two-lane road? Is that what I heard? Road diet. Road diet. Uh, but there are other things we can look at. See, we, we don't not hear everybody. There are so many things that everybody just assumes and they're on social media. The council this, the council that, the council this. Guys, I've spent 20 years, 10 as your mayor, down here at City Hall 20, 30 hours a week, you know, for $14,000 a year because I love this city and I hear everything you say. And I go to this staff and Mr. Cobb, would you agree with me on that? Yes, sir. Right? Dr. Korea, how many times do I call you about stuff? Bobby, you're on speed dial. <laughs> I bothered the other chief a lot more than I bothered the new chief, but... Uh, um, and Jeff, I still don't even know you work for the city, but anyway. <laughs> Um, he's just the quiet one. So we hear everything you're all saying. I can, I'm speaking for myself. You know, at, at, at this point, to transmit this, there's no harm. We're not approving anything. That allows that team, this team, to actually now put together 
everything that everybody has brought up tonight. It doesn't come back the way everybody likes it. Well, then we can have that conversation. It, 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 it's, there's a lot of advantages here, especially when you start with the water. Because then we, we still have the golf course. You know how much land we've bought over the years? Does anybody have any idea how many acres that we've bought to preserve in this city? You've heard me tell it at the uh, states of the cities that I've done. Per capita, Seminole County City, this city is more than double any other city with preserved land, conservation land, park land. And now we're looking at adding more of it. Now, that number that I threw out there, that's a working number because that's what Mr. Llewellyn is paying, half of what he's paying for the land. That's the base number right now. You guys want the land for free? We can get it for free, but then he'll need 1,200 units. That's just how it works. It's simple math. You know, the, the more dense he can build it, the more value his 24 acres has, the more that you can buy, the less you, we would buy the land for him. So, I mean, it's all a trade-off. He cut the thing back, added in components that we were asking for, has the road structure built in. It, everybody doesn't even notice the east-west route because nobody has even talked about it. That east, uh, Madeline, could you just turn that easel for everybody so they can see it? I, I'm pointing to it. And, most people can't see it. Uh, that one. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. The east-west route going from the traffic circle over to Clara Lake, eventually, folks, that route is going to connect to 434 right where Express Oil is. All right, if you've ever noticed, and kudos to the staff, there is a double wide lane. If anybody has used Express Oil, and if you haven't, you really have to go over there and use them. They are great folks. A uh, little advertisement for them. Uh, double wide lane that looks like a little road pulling into their project. That's because eventually that is going to connect to that and add more circulation in the intersection. So to say we don't plan, to say there isn't a plan, to I, I, I understand. The five of us sit up here, we do this every day. So to us, it's second knowledge. You see an orange sign, lots of panic. I get it. But I, I just want to assure you that there is a plan for everything everybody has brought up. The schools, somebody else, somebody brought the schools up. Guys, I, I mentioned that at the beginning. We don't like it. We don't like it any more than you like it. But that's the law. That's the state statute. That's not our statute. That isn't the city council saying we don't care about the schools. That's the way the state has set it up. They want to fill the capacity before districts build more buildings. They want the districts to actually rezone. That's what they want them to do. And let's talk about that. Right? That, that is like, I, I understand, it's like a curse word. I get it. Nobody wants, you know, their, their children uprooted. My daughter, we did not move once. Debbie and I moved to Oviedo, live on Suncrest Court, in the same house we built the day we moved down here, March of 1996. My daughter Amanda, because of all the growth that, of homes that many of you live in right now, went to four different elementary schools because of rezoning. That's how many she went to. Started at Stenstrom, went to Parton, off to Caroline, back to Evans, where she teaches now, which so it's actually pretty cool. She was in the first class at Evans, graduated Evans, now she teaches there. So, you know, I get it. I've, I've lived it. My younger daughter, uh, Krista, was uh, Caroline Evans. We never moved. One went to Oviedo High School. Guess where the other one went? Haggerty High School. We get it. So we understand all they're asking for is the opportunity for us to transmit it 
let the state take a peek at this thing, let them sit down with the staff, go back to LPA. Rick has already told us that he'll go out and do community meetings with everybody on this plan. And let's just give them the opportunity. When they come back in November, Rick and I have had uh, just a few conversations, would I say, Rick, over the years. And everything you've all asked for, I've told that man to do. And actually, he'll probably tell you, I told him his first plan was dead on arrival and to bring in a plan more like this. But he didn't listen. So I, I've waxed on for a long time. I, I appreciate the latitude from my counsel. Uh, wanna, do you want to go or do you want me to start down at the end Let and me go. work across? Let me go. Okay. Councilman Hank. <clears throat> So I'll try to be a little bit more brief. The reason I wanted to go because uh, I'm sorry, I had five pages of stuff. Well, I got I've taken a lot of notes, and I hope I can read my own writing. But um, the reason I wanted to go is because I want my other three colleagues to have a completely different perspective on this project than the mayor does. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just preface a couple things. First off. Um, Rick emailed me a couple times, and I have stayed very close to, to the staff to find out what was going on and, and stay in touch, and he's a very nice man. Um, Tara has been in here multiple times, as I think you could all see. She's one of the young, brilliant minds, genius when it comes to this stuff. But having said that, I'm going to disagree with a lot of it tonight. Um, I do want to just address uh, the, you know, a light moment, but this is like Facebook Live in here. All these screenshots that people send me with names. You all came to the podium tonight. This was awesome. You know? um, as many of you know, I don't do f uh, Facebook, but I get a lot of screenshots from people, so uh, it's nice to see some of the, some of the names and the, and the faces. Um, I learned a long time ago, you stay off social media, you don't have to deal with it. I'd rather deal with you all one-on-one -on -one like this. Um, I want to just address two things before I get into this. One, one gentleman came up and said, you know, two are leaving and we don't care. Well, let me tell you something. I think anybody that knows me knows that this collar will always be blue and I'll always be one of you guys and I'm going to fight that way, um, whether I'm here or I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to spend a little more time at the beach, but I'm, I'm going to be here in Oviedo and there's an election every year, so don't, don't ever forget it. We didn't die. <laughs> no, no, we didn't die. I also heard somebody say about the not in my backyard. Uh, I won't mention names, but obviously 16 years ago, somebody wanted to park 20 gas station pumps right next to Parton Elementary. I was not elected. I think that was my call to, to come into politics. Yes, it was three blocks from my house, but it was also where thousands of kids go to school every day. And I was not just me by myself going to have 20 gas pumps put next to these schools so a truck could come in, leak, and you know, run down Twin Rivers Boulevard into the pond behind it and endanger kids. So the assessment you heard, not in my backyard, is completely false. And as a matter of fact, that developer called me a few years ago, long after it, and said, you know what, Steve? He says, I have to tell you, nobody broke my chops more than you did on that by how yourself. You that, bro? Tell them how you solved that, By yourself. But the way, I, the way we solved it was we worked with him and we built a project that was better. And it's not dangerous. And I can tell you, if any of you have been to Backstreet Pizza, they do a great job. At my house, I can smell that. I did not want my community smelling gas. So we'll just disagree on that. But um, we did. But we took care of that. So um, let, me just, let me just go in and then we'll let, we'll let the other three go on. Is this, is this a good project? It might be a good project, but not today. You know, I think that we are a few years early. Um, I think when you take a look at what we did at Oviedo on the Park, and here's where I, I have some, some problems. So Oviedo on the Park is originally designed to have 1,600 units. This council and past council said, wait a minute. And we talked about it for years, and this is where I have a little disagreement. And, and I do want to say this. When, when we're all done here, we're all going to walk out and be friends. This is no disrespect for how this vote goes, because I have an idea how it's going to go. But I'm, going to, I'm never going to leave here and say it didn't come from here. And tonight it's going to come from here. So 1,600 units at Oviedo on the park. We cut it to less than half that. Why did we do that? Because we didn't want all the traffic. 
So now we're going to take 600 units and just move it all across the street, and that's all of a sudden good. You know what I'm saying? So that I have a little, a little problem justifying. Um, we talked about the schools. I remember when I lived in New York, I looked up Oviedo and these wonderful schools. Somebody moves in here, and, you know, and, and I think it needs to be known. The mayor may have, may have told you all in the beginning, you know, the school system has this, this system where if they have capacity somewhere, we're good. Well, if I move to Oviedo, I want my kid to go to Parton or, or Stenstrom or whatever. I don't want them bust somewhere else. So that becomes a problem for when you overburden the schools, and I can tell you, that our schools don't have much room, if any. I mean, you see Stenstrom building stuff. You see portables everywhere. So, um, so that's an issue. Um, you now we talk about three hundred thousand dollars that we're going to pay to keep those perk ponds going. Well, it's going to cost a lot more for all the police, all the public works, and all the roads. You know, I'm 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 sounding not like a council member in what you all have been emailing and telling me. And, and I agree with you all, to be honest with you. Um, 426 and 419, yes, that road is going to get widened one day. And this council and past councils did a great job taking our sales tax money that we did not have to do, and we put it to speed it along. But let's face it, folks, that ain't going to be done for six to eight years. So this is a quality of life issue for me. We have to put up with it for six to eight years. When that's all done, I think everything will be fine, assuming. Uh, uh, hang on one second. Hold on. No, 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 no. Six to eight years? We're, 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 I am talking you? about 426 and 419 being completed all the way down to Publix. That is six okay. to eight years away. Well, that's fa right. Phase two will be done in a few years, right, which gets it to the bowling alley. Right. It's always been phase three from the bowling alley to Lockwood. So let's not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking not, about the full project. Okay. Six to eight years. That, that's fine. That right. I'll give you. But phase two will be done in a few years, and that's where it's needed. And Mitchell Hammock widening, you know, we've talked about this. Deputy Mayor has brought this up. Mitchell Hammock widening does nothing unless you come through with the back of Winn Dixie and come out to 419, <laughs> which I'm sure the people in Econa Green are not going to like that, you know? Yeah, so, so that's not an option right now. Um, you know, I look at parkland. The mayor points out very correctly, we have more parkland than any city in Seminole County, and that is true. We do. So why do we need more? I don't want to spend $7.5 million. I want to get out of debt. And we're, we're doing a really good job of getting out of debt. We have so much parkland, I don't see a need for 35 more acres. Now, I am going to say to, to Rick's and, and Tara's credit, you know, should this thing pass, the one good thing about it is, is that half of it will be undeveloped. And that's something I struggled with because that, that was a good, a good move, move on their part. Um, let's see. I, you know, I just feel like we're just putting more of a burden on ourselves. You know, common sense just tells you when you drive along Mitchell Hammock in the rush hour, and we have more stuff coming in Oviedo on the park. We have more restaurants coming. We, we had our, a developer friend in here a couple weeks ago, Ford's Garage, all these other things. At some point, you just have to say, and, and I have a lot of other things I could say, but I'll just close with this. At some point, you have to just look around, and I always say to the city manager, Brian, do I not say this? We're good. Let's just fix what we have and make it great. We don't need any more. But I also want to say developers, lawyers, and realtors are not bad people. I read all this stuff on Facebook. These guys do a good job. And then I will tell you, Mr. Cavanaugh, who was beat up here for years, built a nice project across the street. Um, but keep that in mind when you vote. We cut half of it off, and we all said because it was too dense. And we didn't want all the traffic, so to put it there now, I just think is uh, is is not it's not responsible. And we've we've heard. And what's really good tonight, I think all five candidates for for city council are here tonight. Maybe after tonight, we might only have two candidates left after they say, "Wait, this may not be for me." But um, but they all talk about smart growth <coughs> and. To me, it's just not smart to overburden a road that uh, a road network that right now can't handle it. Go drive on Mitchell Hammock outside of the Kings Bridges, okay? 
the road is constantly chewed up. I say to Bobby all the time, yeah, we got to repave it. So with just our regular traffic, um, we're having that, that issue. So listen, all of this could be debated. The mayor is chomping right now to, to, to cut every one of those, and, and I respect him more than I, I respect most people. He has done a phenomenal job here. We're going to just have to agree to disagree on this one, and we're going to put it in the hands of, of my colleagues. But I feel like, Oviedo, we brought you the restaurants. We brought you the hospital, which we, we needed. And we, I think we would have done anything to get that. Um, we have expanded some roads. I mean, we're going to expand this road, Oviedo Boulevard, down to Alexandria. That's wonderful. You're going to put 600 more homes. You can expand roads. Keep bringing houses. It doesn't work. Period. Um, so that's just how I feel. I'm always going to vote from the heart. I don't need to be in the majority all the time. I suspect I, I, I don't know. I'll wait to hear. But if I lose this one, I lose it. But you know what? I have five more meetings. I walk out of here. I did what I thought was right for you all. And I've always done that. Not that this decision would be something bad, but I have to vote from the heart. So that's how I feel tonight. But I don't want you to beat up on the developer or Tara. They do a great job. Or anybody up here who votes it. This is just opinions. And to all you folks that are the five of you out there that are going to come up here, if you have a bad decision, don't go home on Facebook and throw your colleagues under the bus. Whatever the decision is, we have to stick with it as a community and make sure that it works the best, uh, the best we can. But uh, the five of you out there, you've got some tough decisions to make. And I'm kind of glad you all saw this tonight. So respect for the mayor, respect for my colleagues. Wherever it goes, it goes. But I just felt like that's the right thing for our city right now. And, and, and one thing to close, the gentleman who is sitting next to Ingrid, the soldier, you, your comments hit me. I, I took them to heart very well. You, you spoke about this happening overseas during your military career. You've seen this go on when you overdevelop and you don't have the infrastructure. That project they're doing, by the way, I will say, if we had the capacity, probably is the best we're going to see because one day it could be worse and that's for the next council. But your comments, if people go back and watch it, he, he, he really hit me tonight. Not that you all didn't, but he was right on the money, I feel. So wherever it goes, it goes. Oviedo, as the mayor said, will always be great. Whoever sits up here will make sure it's great. And I'm just going to close with this because I do see so many Facebookers out there and I see your post. Just, just lighten up a little bit. You know, we're just five people trying to do the right thing. Two of us won't be here. 33 years will be gone and you'll have, you know, two new people up here and whoever it is, whether it's Randy or, or Emma or Barry or Judith or Megan, whatever, they will do fine too. But don't, Forget this Facebook stuff. Go on there and talk to your nephews and your nieces and lighten up a little bit. You know, that's all I have. All good. <clears throat> Who wants to go next? <clears throat> I'll start. All right, not start, but continue. Um, so I heard something tonight, and we we're talking about the impact fees uh, revenue that we <clears throat> wouldn't receive um, because of the road. Well, if there was no project, there's no revenue at all. So if there's, if we're giving something to, to create something that will have tax revenue and may not have the impact fee revenue, it's still generating revenue. Um, I heard about infrastructure um, and that it's, it needs to keep up. Well, that's a study that, that the city does and that we have consultants do that, that, that talks about whether we have the proper infrastructure in place. Um, specifically ele electrical infrastructure, I heard someone say, um, that's Duke and FPNL. But for this project, it would be Duke. They're the ones that keep the electrical inf infrastructure in place. That's not a city responsibility on that. We, we, they're the ones that are responsible for that. And the Public Service Commission is responsible for that as well. Um, the, this community, um, I heard a resident that, that's lived here for 14 years talk about it being rural. 14 years ago, the community was not rural. It, it, it's been a city for a while. The Oviedo on the Park was a project back then. It just got delayed because of, of a, a developer issue. And then the, the economy collapsed. And now it's back, and Oviedo on the Park is here. Um, but Oviedo isn't rural. When we 
when when the citizens of Seminole County voted for that rural boundary out there they also voted for the urban boundary on this side um, for for the development um, the uh, let's see what else do I have um, the the spray field leases if we if we could continue to pay for these spray fields here but you know it'd be much better if we actually owned the land and then we could take it over after after we we've paid for it um, I, I understand the concern about debt um, but there's ways of the ways of managing this and and the mayor had presented it which was a great analysis on how we actually save money in the whole process of of after the lease payments and shifting everything and we could have it all here right now we you know and this is this would be our land we could do what we want with it um, and there's there's a potential for a public safety building here and the developer has offered to help us put that together if he's already mobilized on the site he's already here he's already can can access plans he can save us so much money on building that public safety building and it could be much better than what we could have ever done ourselves. Um, the Mitchell Hammock, um, I, I heard uh, uh, someone talk about Mitchell Hammock and, and how bad it is. That's on the plans for this next year's budget, repaving Mitchell Hammock. And we're going to be spending a lot of time and effort getting Mitchell Hammock back up to, to standards. Um, it's been, it has been, um, it, yeah, it's been a while since that's been done. We and lived in Kingsbridge when we, when last time we did Mitchell Hammock Road because you all complained with the noise all night long. That was what, about 2003, four, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. It's been a while. Yeah, and, and I've, I've looked at all the plans for widening Mitchell Hammock Road. I, I've tried to be a big proponent of that big proponent of moving the, the transmission lines over, trying to work with Duke to do that. But like everybody said, it dead ends in a Lockwood. And, the, and, there's, and so you, you have all this flow going and it just stops there. The, the 419, 426, all that widening that is gonna take some time, um, but that, that sh will alleviate a lot of the traffic. I live out on the east side of the city and you know, short of having to deal with the school traffic on uh, for Oviedo High School, it, it's a faster route for me to go that way than to go Mitchell Hammock. And if more people started choosing that route, they would they would see that. Um, but the, this developer, he could, and and everybody stated that he could build on the property um, that's already zoned for this, and he could build you know he he has the rights to build up to i forget what the number of of square foot of of commercial space is but it's it's pretty large it would have a huge impact and there's not a whole lot we could do to 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 persuade him not to do that but what he's offering us is something that's got less density uh, uh, less of an impact from a density standpoint he's offering us a road he's offering us public land I mean, he has listened to what went on at the LPA, and he is, he is really trying to work with us. And if, I, if I'm correct, I think he even wants to live in this community at, at some point. So, so he's not going anywhere. He's not building something, and once he builds it, turning it over and selling it to somebody else. He's, he's actually wanting to, to be invested in this community. So... I, I really recommend giving him a chance and, and, and submitting this to, to the state and let him come back with a developer's agreement and, and the, the, along with this plan. And when that developer agreement comes back, I, you know, I want to make sure that it's, it's whatever we come up with and is in stone with a signature on it, so when we approve it, there's no backing out. There's no selling this out afterwards saying, oh, here's all the designations, you got it. I, I want to make sure that that, you know, whatever it comes up with, that it's in stone. But I, I do recommend, um, 
giving him, sending the transmittal and at least getting the ball rolling so we can see exactly what everything's going to look like with the site plan, the developer's agreement, and everything else. Because right now, a lot of that is still up for negotiation. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. Paper? No. Okay. Who wants to go? I'll go. You're up. <laughs> Councilman Chuck, now you'll get to go after him. I'm sorry. I'll You're good? I'm good. All right. Well, smart got a couple, I got a couple things, but keep it. Going. Let me just start off with uh, <clears throat> and say that uh, those of you who think we just get up here and uh, make these decisions willy nilly uh, need to understand that we're, we live here too. We have, I lose sleep over this just like you all do too. Uh, we're not up here to make bad decisions, we're up here to make the decisions that are best for the city. Now, It'd be nice if we could just build a, a dome over the city. And I'll, I'll go back to 1980 when I was going to UCF. 3,000 people lived here. And then when I moved here in 1990, 11,000 people lived here. 2,000, 26,000. 2010, 33,000. Now we're up to almost 40,000. Uh, if you average that out, that's 900 people a year moved to this city since 1980. So why don't we build a wall around the city and we'll let 900 people in and then cut it off. That doesn't solve the problem either because if you look at Seminole County, they're growing at about uh, five to 7,000 people a year. I have a friend that uh, works with me at NASA. He's retiring. He's going to work for the Census Bureau. He came in the office the other day and said, you know, Oviedo's a strange city. I'm, I'm taking census reports in these neighborhoods in Oviedo and right next door is a horse farm. And so where are you doing that at? He says, I know Lockwood Boulevard. I said, that's not the city. That's the county. All those people, that 5,000 people that are moving to the county, guess what? They got to go through Vito if they want to go to Lake Mary, or if they're in Lake Mary and want to go to UCF, they come through the city. So when we talk about traffic, there's a lot we don't have control over. Mitchell Hammock is, is the cards we have to play right now, and we're doing what we can to deal with it, and it's going to take a couple more years. I saw something else around here while I was uh, looking up status. Uh, Oviedo, 83% of the drivers in Oviedo are single drivers in a car. Most drivers uh, in the city that commute average about 27 minutes a day in their commutes, and that's actually higher than average. I drive about an hour a day with my wife, but we're, there are two of us, so that's only 30 minutes each. Weird math. What I'm getting to is that we, we sit up here and have to make the best decisions for the city as a whole. And, and sometimes I get criticized uh, because I take a longer view than most. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna make a decision that's good for the city today. And then 30 years from now, we regret it. Uh, we've done that with the water plant that we could have gotten for free in 1990. And we ended up paying $35 million for it 25 years later. So what I see as our decision is to, to let the developer go back and do what he's entitled to do or try to get something better. Uh, it's, the mayor laid it out. It's pretty sophisticated. It's not simple math. It's, there's a lot, of, a lot of pieces that have to come together. But in the long run, yeah, there's going to be more people here, but there's 900 people a year moving here anyway. Where are we going to put them? We can build high rises. And that, that would solve the density problem, uh, but we're not. We're going to try to do the best we can and fit it in as best we can in that space that's available and not overcrowd, but to be smart about it. That, that word gets dangled around a lot, and it's, it's tough to do. We're doing the best we can up here. I think we're going to get the best deal we can in the future. I personally uh, wasn't going to vote for this tonight. I've been back and forth. Uh, my heart is with you all that don't want to do this. Uh, I've got to look at the future, though, and say, well, something's going to happen out there. I'd, I'd rather have something good happen that we're looking at than, than what they're entitled to. I don't want to see a strip mall and a bunch of fast food places. Um, that being said, uh, this isn't a done deal. We've got a, a couple steps to go. And Brian, I, I just have a quick question for you on the uh, police station. 
Where does that fit into all the plans here? I know we, we voted for it, and I thought we had a spot for it, but is that changing? Right now, we have, we have a plan for a new building here on campus. But with this property, it does open up opportunities as well. Uh, when you think about the extension of Avita Boulevard and how we could, if we could front on that, it would give us greater access uh, to the entire city. So it is an opportunity. Uh, we, but we do have our plans for an on-campus building as well. Okay, and it's something to. It would at. be a secured facility. Yes, sir. Okay, so that you know, there's there's flexibility there. I I want to see that police station come sooner than later. I I don't want to see this to delay it, but I I think it might be worthwhile if we can get a better facility with the with the functionality that we want. Uh, that that will go a long way for. For the future and that's that's what we have to sit up here and do is look look for what the citizens here 30 years from now are, are going to be looking at and what we've done for them and not have them have to make up for the mistakes we've made because we didn't think long term enough good councilman chud now <clears throat> well it's not much more to say a lot of things have been discussed uh a lot of a lot of this has come around about the traffic uh, if you want to see where about 40 to 45 percent of the traffic comes westbound in the morning, stand at Live Oak Reserve Boulevard and 419. Chuliota, <laughs> uh, uh, Geneva, and Lake Pickett. They're going to the 417. There's only one way there. Your option is you go as you could, uh, from Lake Pickett. You could go down Colonial to the 417, but nobody in their right mind is going to do that. What would help and is not going to happen is an entrance onto the 408 to come to hook up to the uh, 417 instead of just going down to Orlando. That would take traffic out of Oviedo. That's not going to happen. So the traffic issues westbound in the morning and eastbound, a lot of that's passed through. Like uh, Councilman Britton said, we have no control over that. Some of the housing developments or apartments that are being built in the county just outside Oviedo, again, we have no control over that. It affects our infrastructure, it affects our roads, it affects the schools, and we have no control over it. The other thing with traffic is uh, you would be surprised when there's a traffic crash or a parade or something, how many people who have lived here a long time know one way to get home. You're laughing, but you know it's true. And someone had mentioned about the use of the side streets to take off, again, uh, uh, to take that uh, traffic off, off, the main, off the main roads. Proper use of those streets is not a bad thing. Again, a lot of the speeding that's in the communities are from the residents in the communities, not people passing through. There's, a, there's good things about this project, but tonight, it's nothing more than transmitting it to the state. Is that correct, Mr. Cobb? That's correct. It's not approving anything. You're not approving anything. And that's just something that we have to consider and something you should consider. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Chief, how many times of, when you were chief did um, your neighbors in Live Oak call you and ask you to set radar up on Live Oak Reserve Boulevard? And, they still do. <laughs> or even on Alafaya Woods Boulevard. They still do. Right. But you found out that it was most of the folks lived in the neighborhood. Well, especially with Live Oak, you don't go off of 419 to go through Live Oak to come back on 419. Oh, that is true. <laughs> that is true. So it's 90% of the people living in there that are the speeding issues. Yeah, it, it, it does happen all the time. And the only reason why I brought that point up is I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. I live off of Chapman by Evans. And years back, I, I was newly elected. Chief Drago was still here. My neighbors are complaining that the people who live down on the farms are flying down Chapman Road. We need a, 
we need the police out here. Well, I went to Chief Drago and Chuck said, sure, I'll get with the traffic units. And they went out there and they set up the radar and 22 people in my neighborhood got speeding tickets. <laughs> 22. All called me up and told me we have the worst police officers in the world. They gave me a speeding ticket. Uh, yeah, it's usually the folks in the neighborhood, but um, all right, does anybody else want to add anything for the good of the order? I mean, we've uh, debated this uh, long enough, I believe. Good. Um, I just uh, need to entertain a motion to transmit ordinance number 1682 to the Department of Economic Opportunity for review. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, call the vote. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion passes.